Okay, it says it's recording. Okay. All right, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs> we had a full house yesterday. Uh, I think everybody opted for WebEx today, except for the two brave people that are here with me. Uh, oh, third, oh, no, here's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just when you're done, just flip the lock and close the door. You got it. You will probably all be gone. At okay. Cool. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, uh, uh, thanks for coming. Um, uh, to start things off, I'll start them off the same way I did yesterday. Um, for delegated admins, we have not published the support address uh, for OIT on the website. This was intentional, so I'm telling everybody what it is during this session. It's similar to the Connect one. It's box underscore support at oit.ruckers.edu. Um, this address is for use by delegated administrators only. It should not be given to users, and users should not be copied on messages to box support. Please do not do that. Um, if you do, Vlad will yell at you um, and not sign the message. Uh, so, uh, yeah, please keep that, that message. Uh, we're not going to post that on the website because users will find it and use it. Um, and other notes here. Um, I've got, uh, yesterday it took me about 40 minutes to go through the, the material, so we had plenty of time for questions. So um, there are slide numbers in the, in the corner of every slide. Um, so if you, wanna, if you have a question, um, take a note. On, and if we have to go back to the slide, we can. But I think it'll be easier if I kind of go through the material. And then I'll, I'll stay and answer questions until the university closes or 5 o'clock, whichever comes first. Um, OK, so uh, if you want to download a copy of the slide deck that I'm about to show, the link that's on the screen, um, We'll let you do that, and I will talk about using these links later in the presentation. So I'll give everybody a second to uh, to take that down. Um, we're also going to post uh, this uh, slide deck on the on the box website, so you'll have it there as well. All right. All right, so brief overview about Box. So this is unlimited storage. Someone asked yesterday what unlimited means, and so far we have had no one tell us that it's anything but unlimited storage. All the other universities store everything they can think of in Box, and none have gotten uh, a blink from Box about how much space they're using. Um, uh, if you're looking for information on what can be stored in Box, you can go to the Box website, which is now up and running. Um, it, is a, um, it is still a work in progress, um, but it is functioning. And if you go under using box, the data classification metrics, matrix is available. And you can see that we've put information up here that details exactly what can and cannot be stored in box. Um, the items with question marks means that there are, um, there are conditions. And if you hover over the question mark, you can see the detail of what those conditions are. Um, and we'll talk a, a little bit more about that stuff uh, a bit later. Uh, there are file type restrictions when it comes to storing things in Box. So, for example, it will not let you, it will not automatically sync certain file types. So Quicken files, QuickBooks files, um, the Box Drive client, either on Mac or Windows, will not automatically sync those things up to the Box cl uh, cloud. You can upload them manually through the web interface if you want to. You can also use FTPS to put those files up there, but they won't sync automatically. Um, if you click on the link in this presentation, it will give you a full list of files. It's not just Quicken. Um, there are some file name patterns. It won't store uh, Google Docs files because those are cloud-based files, so it can't store those. Um, uh, using Access on Box is, is interesting, um, and by interesting, I mean you shouldn't do it. Um, and you can see the details on that if you click on the link. Um, the only limit that we know about in Box is the four file per second upload limit. So it doesn't matter how big the file is, um, four files per second is the maximum rate in which you can push data into Box. The, this isn't a problem if you're uploading larger files because bandwidth will be the limitation, but if you're setting up a ton of really small files, you will hit this limit. The, the 15,000 file per directory advisory isn't a limit. You can put more than 15,000 files in a folder in Box. But they advise us that once you get beyond that, you, you may, you may 
uh, see a performance degradation uh, in, the, in the software uh, when you're trying to access things. Okay, uh, so for delegated admins, uh, the, uh, we have a, a, a setup procedure. Um, you can click on this link, it'll take you to the setup form. Most people should have done this already. Um, the unit head in that form is not your boss necessarily, unless your boss is a dean director um, or other type of unit head at the university. Um, in general, we expect that there's going to be one delegated, one shared account for each major area at the university. There's really not a lot of reason to have multiple of these because you can delegate permissions below that structure. Um, the shared folder count is the number of, of separate shared accounts and folders that you're going to need to store data. So, for example, if you're storing PHI in Box, that needs to be in a separate account from your other data. Now, if you don't mind the extra restrictions that PHI brings with it, then you can store everything in a PHI folder and then you only need one. But if you're going to store other stuff and you want to be able to have a little looser security, then you want to request two folders. The notes section is for you to give us any information that you might need us to know. So if you want to have two other people with, uh, set up as delegated admins to the shared account, um, you want to let us know in there. If you have any other special conditions, you want to let us know in there. Uh, the RAD setup uh, happens at the same time at, after you submit this form. Uh, I'm sorry, I skipped DocuSign. So the DocuSign process is part of this. So once you put in the information about who your unit head is, they will get an email and they need to sign it or your delegated admin account will not be created. So you should warn whoever that is. Um, this is a relatively new thing for Rutgers because we have a DocuSign license now, so not everybody expects it. Um, so let them know it's coming. As part of the setup process, you will get an, uh, an ADM account. You'll need to request that in, in the uh, uh, NetID system. This is basically just NetID-ADM, and this is where all your permissions to be a delegated administrator will exist. We will not set delegated admin permissions regular NetID account because we don't want you managing the account from your regular account. Keep in mind that if you set up a sync client, for example, and you have and you delete a bunch of files because they're all associated with your regular account, then you may need to look at their data as well. So that's why we wanted to keep that separate. Um, if you're not already in RAD, the, uh, an OU will be created for you because box groups will be managed in Active Directory and then synced down to Box. So that's, the, so that's the model we're using to manage groups in Box. So that's why you'll need the organization. If you have any requests after the initial setup procedure, and you can send mail to that Box support address, and changes can be made. You only use that form for the initial setup. All right, so user setup. Uh, the Box website has two buttons on it right now. One is for users that already have an account to log in, and the other is for sign up. When they click on sign up, they'll choose manage services, choose box, they, hit, they proceed, and they'll accept the terms of service, and the account will be set up. When the account's provisioned, it's created as netid at Rutgers.edu. All of the user's known email addresses at Rutgers will be associated with that account. So if they, have an, if they have other accounts with other domains, if your data is shared with the user in Box at any of those email addresses, it will work. But they log into Box using netid.rutgers.edu. When the account is provisioned, all the group memberships are synced automatically at the time of provisioning, and all the email addresses are provisioned so that that stuff will work immediately after the person logs in. <laughs> Okay, so if you're a delegated administrator, DA, uh, there, there are certain responsibilities uh, on you uh, with respect to Box. Uh, you are the primary contact for users who need support. So anybody that has a delegated administrator, those people should be going to you as the DA for their first line of support, and then you contact the help desk. It's one of the reasons we don't want that email address getting out there. Um, you are also the primary contact if OIT needs, some, needs to contact you about one of your users. So, uh, and then there's the box support address again. Um, if you are managing restricted data, uh, PHI, a, a DA, you must be, a DA is required in any unit that plans to store PHI in box. 
PHI can only be stored in share folders that are designated for PHI. It cannot be stored in private folders. Technically, a user can copy whatever they want into those folders, but by policy, they should only be storing PHI in the shared folders, not in their private folders, okay? When you become a delegated administrator, you'll have access to the shared folders under your shared account. It's your responsibility to maintain, uh, you know, whatever, you, whatever structure you need in that account. Um, the, uh, you do not have access to the primary, to the private folders. Private folders are a user's individual area, and the only way you have access to information in that folder is if they shared it with you, or you made a request for OIT to copy that data into your admin account into a folder so that you can see what's in there. The, the uh, private folder is, is just that, and right now there is no way to delegate uh, permission over those folders, even though I have asked Box to add that as a feature request, but it, you know, I don't want to make it sound like feature requests are things that are going to happen anytime soon. They're, it's just on their list. Okay, if you're handling PHI, um, then again, PHI can only be stored in those shared folders. Sharing from restricted folders can only be done by a delegated administrator. So there's a, a permission inbox that prevents a user from being able to share data from a folder, unless they are an owner or a co-owner of that folder, which is the delegated administrator. So if you're handling PHI, any shares that need to be created from inside that folder, users will have to make a request to you, and if, if it's appropriate, you'll have to set up that share. That's one of the ways we're protecting PHI in box. In addition to make it clear to people which folders have restricted data and which folders don't, all folders that are shared with PHI need to be prefixed with restricted in square brackets. Now, users are gonna be able to create folders that you, when you share a folder with somebody that contains restricted data, they can create subfolders that this is what they need that to be able to store stuff in box. So they're gonna create folders and, and they may not, you can tell them that they should use restricted, but it's not really that big a deal if the folder doesn't have restricted on it, so long as it itself is not shared. So when you share a folder in box, the name of the folder shows up in the root level of the folder, it's, it's, of, the, of the user's private folder that it's shared with. And we want that to stay restricted. So if you're setting up a share and you're the only one that can set up shares in private folders, you have to make sure that that restricted prefix is on the folder name. Uh, and anonymous link sharing is not allowed in folders that contain PHI. It'll be disabled anyway, but I'm just making it clear that it's not allowed. Okay, um, so once you become a delegated administrator, uh, you, you'll manage the box use with three different tools. The first one is not required, okay? If you are an Office 365 delegated admin, there are a few functions that you'll be able to perform. So in order to not have to create an entirely new permission structure for Box to recreate what was done in Office 365, the ability to view a person's account information, the ability to instantly sync email addresses, so if a user updates their email address and you want to get it on their account right away, and the ability to lock and unlock their account can only be performed by someone who is a delegated administrator for that account in Office 365. You can be a delegated administrator and not have an account be a delegated administrator in Office 365. You just won't be able to do those three things. So you can be a delegated administrator with only access in RAD and access in the box web interface. So when you get RAD access, you'll be able to use, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, but you'll use RAD to manage your groups, membership, and which groups sync with box. And then in the box web interface, there's an admin console that you'll be able to use to manage the permissions on the folders and files based on users and groups. So there is no requirement to be an Office 365 admin unless you need to be able to perform those three functions that are listed. Okay, shared accounts, why they're recommended. So uh, we're recommending that people store institutional data in shared accounts because even though it's unlimited storage everywhere, and you could presumably store everything in your own personal account, 
If you ever leave Rutgers, when your account gets removed, so does all the data, even if it's shared with other people. So we want to make sure that the data is stored in those shared accounts so that it persists independent of any individual user's net ID. The number of accounts that you need uh, depends on how you're using it. So typically a group that, a, a unit that handles PHI would want to have two accounts, one for non-PHI data and one for PHI data. The only other circumstance that I've come across so far that would justify creating a third shared account would be if there was a need for some kind of management separation. So for example, if in, a, in an academic department there was a, a grant received and a permit and the, the grant required that only the researchers involved had permission to access the folder and you needed to, you needed to make sure that the people above who would normally have access didn't. Uh, that's the only case I've come across. So typically one to two folders are all that you would need. Okay. Once you get access to your shared account, there, there, uh, once you get a access to your shared level folder, a folder is going to show up in your ADM account that you can then create a folder structure underneath. You should not be sharing the top level folder. You should be creating folders underneath that, even if you only create one, and then sharing from there. Keep in mind that once you give someone editor access to a folder, they can rename the folder. And if they rename the folder, everybody who's been, that folder has been shared with sees it at, with the new name. We talked to Box about this. They tell us that it's not a problem. We find that a little hard to believe. We've asked for some kind of, again, enhancement request so that we can lock the names of folders. But as of right now, anybody you share a folder with can rename the folder. So you should warn your users not to rename shared folders. Uh, another note on deleted files. So right now, a shared account is created for each area. That shared account, you do not have access to. The folder, your shared folder is created in that account and then shared with you, and that's how you manage it through your ADM account. But you can't access the actual shared account. This means that you can't access the trash in that account. And I bring that up because if a user deletes a file, there is no backup like a traditional on-premise storage. There is just the trash. So if a file is deleted from a shared folder, it shows up in two places, the, person, the, the trash of the user who deleted it and in the trash of the shared folder. If you need to get a file back from trash and you can't have the user restore it, then right now you'll need to ask OIT to get the file back. We understand that this may be a problem, and if it becomes a problem, OIT has said that they will develop a tool to make this easier. Uh, but right now it's a process that has to be done by OIT. In addition, with respect to deleting files, users can delete a file and it will go into the trash. They cannot go into the trash and empty it. We have disabled that capability because there are no backups that we can go back to. So the files will age out after 60 days, and then after they age out, there's still another 14-day window where if you contact OIT, OIT can contact Box, and they can restore a file that's been deleted, that's been removed from trash. But we don't want that to be the norm. If you can get it back while it's still in trash, it makes it much easier. So 60 days, you said, 60 days. 60 days, it out. Okay, naming shared folders. So, again, restricted folders must be prefixed with that name restricted. Unrestricted folders that are shared need to have names that are sufficiently unique. And I show you a a, a, an example of why this is the case. Let's say that you have a user and two different areas share a folder called simply budget. Um, if, in Explorer, you'll see what you see on the, in the top box there, two folders named budget. It shows one was shared by my admin account and one is a folder in my account. So imagine that there's four or five or six of those being shared by all different people. That can get very confusing. In the box web interface, the only thing that really distinguishes between the two is the color of the folder itself. And if you think your users are going to notice that, then 
you train your users better than I train mine. So you want to make sure that any folder that's shared with other people has a sufficiently unique name because it shows up in the root of their box account. So you want them to know what it is. Now, if you create a folder called, you know, school finance office, name, substitute school for your school, that's pretty sufficiently named. And if you're not going to share any folders underneath that, you're fine to have a folder under there that's like grants, whatever, because they have to navigate into that school finance folder in order to get to those other folders. But if you're going to share a folder underneath that that's going to show up in the root of somebody else's account, you want to make sure that it doesn't have a name like this. You want to make sure that the name is sufficiently unique that if someone saw that name without any context whatsoever, they would know what it is. Okay. Sharing with groups. Uh, so there are different ways that you can share a folder. You can share with groups, which I'll talk about more later. You can share with an individual user if you'd like. Um, this is good for one-offs, but generally you're going to want to share with groups so that you don't get that whole situation where if one person leaves, you get the request that says, can you please give Bob the same access as Joe had? And then you've got to look up everything that Joe had, and then it's, it's problematic. So stick with groups if you can. You can share with anonymous shared links, which I will talk about more later. And you can share with widgets. So widgets are very easy to create in Box. You right-click on a folder and say embed widget, and it will give you HTML that you can use to create a widget. Um, the widgets can be for upload or download. And if I can get my web browser to launch here, there we go. Um, I'll show you some examples. So this is a page I put up just to demonstrate the widgets. So, um, loading, loading. Okay. so you can see here that it just puts this in. It's branded based on what our tenant looks like. You can see these files, and I can just download them um, at will if, I give, if I've given them permission. So I can take any of these files. You can also have a, an upload widget where you can drop files in here, and they'll show up in a folder in Box. Uh, so, and these are very easy to do but they, um, they require a web page that, that you can install them on in order to use them. And then email. Uh, you can enable email upload on a folder, so it'll give you an email address, and then any files that are attached to the emails will be dropped into the folder, and then you can put permissions on that. I don't think that's going to get used a lot, but it's there. Okay. All right, group management. So this is where it gets a little complicated. So uh, group synchronization is done by flattening groups in RAD and then moving them into Box. So RAD has a, an organizational hierarchy. Uh, Box does not. So we take the organizational unit name and the school name and, we, uh, and the campus name, and we flatten that to create unique group names in Box. If you're interested in the details of that, look on the Box website. It's all spelled out. A sync process runs once every half hour that brings down all of the groups that you've designated to sync into Box. The groups are synced down based on membership in the group and, own, and the existence of a Box account. Box will not allow a, group, a, a user to be a member of a group if they don't have a Box account. So if you add a user to a group that doesn't have a box account, it creates one, and we don't want that to happen. So we only sync down the members of a group who have a box account already. So you could have a bo an account in Active Directory that has 100 people in it, and when you look in that group in box, it may only have 10 people in it because only those 10 people in that group already have a box account. Now, when the new people sign up for an account, it'll add them automatically, but in but only when they have an account will it be added. You specify what groups will and will not sync by adding them to the sync group. So when your organizational unit is set up or when, you're set up, when your existing organizational unit is set up for Box, a group called your OU name, so for SAS it would be SAS-Box-Sync. You make all the groups you want to sync a member of that group. And so long as that group is in the same organizational unit as you are, that group will sync 
two bucks. So you can manage groups if you're already um, using uh, Active Directory, in, if you're using RAD, you can use the existing AD tools or Citrix. And if you click on the link in this presentation, it will take you to the, the Citrix interface. So once you get set up in Active Directory, this is how you'll access it to manage your group memberships. When you're managing groups in Box, once, once the groups have been created and they've been synced down to Box, you then need to assign them permissions. Your, you'll log into Box with your ADM account, not your regular account. Again, all of your permissions for delegated admin are linked to your ADM account. So you'll log in with your ADM account, you'll go into the, uh, into the, into the admin section, and then you can assign permissions to a folder. So you can tell it that group X is able to access folder X, and then you can set the permission level, and I'll show this. So when you log into the admin console here in the left-hand box, you'll click on that little icon there for admin console. You'll see a list of all the groups that you have access to in box. You'll, and then you'll, once you click on the group, you'll see the screen on the right, and you'll click on that edit button that I have marked with the arrow. When you click on that button, you'll be able to, if you have no folders, you'll click share folders. It'll show you all the folders that you have access to. You pick it, and then you pick the level of access you want that group to have to that folder. And that's it. You've now given permission for the people in that group to access that folder in Box. So it, once this is set up and associated with the group, you can add and remove people from the group and they'll automatically get the permissions. So what do those permission levels mean? So you can see that there's oh, co-owner, editor, reviewer, previewer. So um, you generally are going to give your users editor access. Uh, Co-owner access should only be given to other delegated administrators, and it should only be given to their ADM account. There's nothing prohibiting you, there's nothing technically preventing you from associating a regular net ID and making them co-owner on a folder. But you shouldn't do that. You should only associate ADM accounts with the co-owner permission. Now, if you, this is a very simplified view of the permissions. If you want to see all the details on what the different permission levels mean in Box, you can click on the link at the bottom of the page there, and you'll see exactly why I only showed you the brief permissions, because this chart is a little more complex. So you can review that at your leisure. All right, sharing permissions. So when you, when you go into a folder's permission, you can set these restrictions on a folder. So, and you can choose to set these restrictions even if it's not a PHI folder. So if you want to set up a shared folder and you don't want your users indiscriminately sharing data from that folder, you can check this box that says only folder owners and co-owners can send collaborator invites. That essentially means that they cannot share this folder with anybody else, only you can. Now, this is required for PHI users, for PHI folders, uh, but it is optional for others, and it's up to the delegated administrator to decide whether or not they want to check this box. You can also restrict collaboration specifically to inside Rutgers University. So if you want to let people share, with, if you don't check the first box and you check the second one, that will let people share the, the content in that folder, but will only allow them to share it with content with other people at Rutgers. And then the third restriction is whether or not you're going to allow anonymous shared links from a folder. Uh, whether you're going to allow someone who received an anonymous shared link to become a collaborator on the folder. So this means that you can send out, for example, an anonymous shared link to a mailing list. And anybody that wants to join in collaborating on files in that folder, if you check this box, you can determine what level of access they'll receive when they become a collaborator. Commenting on a folder is just, you can put in comments, kind of like a social media aspect. If you, uh, if you check this box after comments have been made, the comments are hidden, but they are not deleted. Uh, only collaborators can access this folder via shared links. Uh, that basically turns off anonymous shared link uh, access to a specific folder. So again, if you want to restrict anonymous shared links from a folder, you can. Uh, when you are setting up a shared folder, 
if it's not meant to be persistent, you should set an expiration date on the folder so that we don't have all these shared folders with data in them out there forever. Uh, so you can pick a date on which the, the folder will be automatically unshared. A box above it allows you to actually delete the folder on a specific date. You can use this if you want to, just be careful because it will delete the date. Um, email and notification, uh, you can use this. Um, we've turned it on and it sends a lot of email. So uh, just be careful. <laughs> And this is a duplicate screen. I didn't see that yet. Okay. Uh, cross unit collaboration. So um, there is no user ownership in Box. So if you're a delegated administrator, uh, if you're a delegated administrator, Al, did you just send me a note? Uh, there's a chat going on at the same time, and I'm trying to respond to the chat. So just keep okay. on. Okay. I can't see them right now. All right. So I can look at them later. Um, there is no ownership in Box. So if you're a, a, an Office 365 delegated administrator, you're familiar with the whole, my user is moving, your user is moving to my department and you have to give up the user and then I can claim the user. That doesn't exist in Box. Everybody has the ability to add every user to a group. So you can give anyone permission to your data if you choose. So it's on the delegated administrators to remove people from groups when they should no longer have access. And then the new delegated administrator can, at, at any time can add the new permissions for the new group the person's moving to. I would recommend that you give the, the, the delegated administrator from the unit the person's leaving a heads up because as we all know, the IT staff don't often get told when people leave. So just as a courtesy, it might be a good idea to shoot them an email and let them know so that they can double check to make sure things are being removed that should be. Uh, now, if you want to be able to share a folder and collaborate between two different groups, in order to, to give a folder permission to, a, to a, a group permission to a folder, someone has to be a co-owner of, uh, of the group and of the folder. So that means that if I'm an SAS and I need to, and someone in my area wants to collaborate in a folder, a shared folder with another school, then either the other school's DA has to give me, if I create the folder, then the other school's DA has to either give me access to their group so that I can add that group to the folder, or I have to give the other school's DA access to the folder so they can assign the folder to their group, right? So someone's got to have both. You guys can have a conversation between one another and decide who that should be. But that, collab that cooperation has to occur if a shared folder is going to be set up and managed by you. Users can share stuff in their private folders with each other without you getting involved. But if it's going to be a shared folder, that conversation has to happen. All right, some caveats and warnings here. So um, some people have tried to set up desktop redirection in Box. It doesn't work. It's not supported. Some people have gotten it to work somewhat. But if you put in a request and say, I'm trying to set up de desktop redirection, the answer is going to be it's not supported. Folder redirection seems to work. So you can do that, but just an FYI. You should be careful about using Box Drive, and I say in labs here because this is where we saw the problem, but you should be careful of using Box Drive to sync files up to the cloud in any environment where the user is going to log off quickly and the files may be deleted from the machine. So you can understand how this would happen in a lab, right? Think of, you know, 20 kids in a lab. They all save their work at the end of class. They log out, and what happens? Deep freeze or something else runs, and it cleans all the stuff off of the machine that they were just working on. Well, if the log off happened before the sync was complete and the machine gets cleaned, that data is lost. The, log, the synchronization of data does not continue once the user's account is logged out. If it's locked, it will continue. But if it's logged out, it will not. So you need to be careful about using this in environments where that might happen. Now, we, again, asked for an enhancement request from Box to have some kind of setting that would prevent the system from logging off until that sync is complete. But right now, this is what can happen. Um, if you're storing large files in Box, for example, video, you have to be careful because uh, uh, user expectations may be that they can just click on that file and it will run. So the way Box Drive works is by default, files are set up as a streaming access. 
So you double click on the file, it's copied down to your system, opened up, and then it syncs back up to Box. If you're using a four gig, if you're trying to view a four gig video file, it's going to take a little time for that file to download to your system before it's going to open up. And the system response time will, will significantly decrease while it is trying to get that thing onto your system quickly. So what I would recommend, especially if you're using a large file that Box supports, like video files, point the people to a web interface so that they can use the player in the web, because that will come up instantly. It doesn't have to download to your system. So just be cognizant of the, the fact that it takes time for these files to, to download. The alternative is, in Box Drive, you can set it for offline access, but then that's going to sync all those files to the person's local machine. Um, and back up if anything changes. So uh, those are your two options. Another uh, point here is how Box Drive handles executable files on Windows. So you really shouldn't be trying to run things inside Box because, again, it's not running from Box. It's only running from your local system. But in order to try and make executable files available faster, if you simply browse to a folder in, that has an .exe file in it, Box will start downloading that file to the desktop in anticipation of you wanting to click on it. So if you put a really large .exe file in a folder and you start browsing the folder tree and you hit a directory that's got that .exe file in it, your system, again, is going to use a lot of resources trying to get that .exe file down to your system, even though you haven't clicked on it. It's just trying to anticipate that you might. So, you know, you might want to zip it or if you want to keep it up there or something, but if it's an .exe file, it's going to automatically try and download it. Again, We've asked for an enhancement request to see if, if they could give us a configuration setting that would let us affect that behavior, but it doesn't exist right now. The last caveat warning here is about become, accounts when people leave. Box has the ability, so if you look on their website, uh, you'll find documentation that says this, to turn a corporate account into a private account. We are not allowing that because moving the data from a, a corporate account to a personal account brings it, 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 all the data goes with it and we have no idea what's in those accounts so if we do it we're endorsing the move of that data into a personal con account so users can move files themselves they can manage the data on their own but we will not be converting corporate accounts to personal accounts when people leave and their box account gets removed Okay, um, so end user information. When you open up Box, when you click on that sign in button on the Box website, for example, and it asks you for your email address so that you can log in, in the upper right hand corner of the screen, there is a button that says sign up. This is going to confuse people and we can't remove it. Uh, we've asked. Um, what will happen if they click on this button? is it will take them through a box sign-up process as if they were creating a new account. They will enter their Rutgers email address, and then it will tell them, you're not allowed to create an account because your accounts are managed by Rutgers. So it kind of puts them into a kind of a loop. So you may want to tell your users, don't click on the sign-up button. You already have an account, or you can provision one through the box website. Uh, that sign-up button doesn't, isn't for you. Uh, a word about clients. So uh, you the Android client for is, uh, is installed through MDM. So MDM is required in Box. I should have said that first. So in order to connect uh, the client on Android or any mobile device to Box, you have to have the company portal installed on the device, just like if you're using Office 365. On Android devices, this, is, this uses the profile, uh, the work profile setup. So in order to install the app, you actually go into Company Portal, click on Apps, click on the Play Store, and then install Box. You'll notice that there's a bunch of apps in this Play Store. There's a reason for that. Once you have a separate work pro profile set up on your account, all the data from the applications in that profile are saved in that profile. That you can also move data from your personal profile into your work profile but you cannot move data from the work profile into your personal profile. So think about how that works. If you, if you want to open a Word document on your mobile device, you have to have a copy of Word installed through the company portal 
in order for Word to be able to access that file that you downloaded from Box. Now, right now there's a few applications in there in addition to Box. If there are any other applications that you would like to see in there so that you can install it on the work side of a device, you can send an email to Box Support and they will add it. Uh, and there's really no security issue there. It's just keeping it on one side of the device versus the other. In iOS, the, the installation works the same way, but the data is easier to access. So you don't have to worry about the two sides of the device thing. So the Apple devices are simpler. Box Drive for Mac and Box Drive for Windows can be installed on the system. You can manage them as you see fit. People have created case packages to push things to people's systems. Um, you can ask for one of those and we can make it available to you if you'd like, um, uh, or you can manage it on your own. Uh, the Box Sync app is disabled. So if you go to the Box website, they're going to show you a Box Sync app and a Box Drive app. The Box Sync app is going to be discontinued by Box at some point, but right now it's still available. It's still available because there used to be two apps that you would use, Box Drive, which only worked as a streaming app, and Box Sync, which only worked as a sync app. They've now added the ability to make files available offline in Box Drive, so there's no reason to use Sync. So we have it turned off. If you try and install Box Sync, even if you follow all the rules and have all the MDM, well, the MDM stuff doesn't matter, but if, even if you uh, install it on your device and try and log in, uh, it will not work. We have it turned off. Uh, keep in, uh, we have file versioning on, Box has the ability to save every version of a file, and we have it turned on. So um, right now, an unlimited number of, well, not that many, um, an unlimited number of versions of every file will be saved in Box. We did this because of the next item, auto-saving. So if you're using Office 365 apps on your workstation right now, and you have that auto save button turned on, it doesn't work unless you're saving stuff in OneDrive. But Microsoft plans on making that work no matter where you save at some point. And you know, if you've ever used that, you know that it saves every few seconds. So if we were to set file versioning to, for example, 100, which is the next setting below unlimited, uh, then after a few minutes, you would save 100 versions of a file and you'd never be able to go back to an old version. So we've set it to unlimited, but it's going to save every few minutes uh, when that feature is available in the local version. Now, if you're using the web version of uh, Office 365, so if you, open up, if you open up Box on the web and say, I want to edit a Word document, it will start the web version of Word, and it will save the file in Box, and it will save every few seconds. Uh, because that's where it's saving its data. So you will, if you look at the version history on that file, see tons of copies of things that you'll have to scroll through if you want to go back. It's just the way it works. Right now, they don't have any ability to recognize the differences between files. OneDrive does this better. Obviously, it's a Microsoft product. They have the concept of major versions and minor versions, and, and it, it handles it better. Right now, Box just saves everything. And that is... It, uh, I will, before I open it to questions, one thing that came up yesterday was a question about deprovisioning. So I've already talked about the fact that we will not allow box accounts to become personal accounts. The other question is how long will the data sit there after someone leaves? The, the short answer is it's going to be the same as Office 365. Um, the longer answer is, is I can't tell you exactly uh, what that is. They're still working on it. So uh, Vlad's description to me was that there will be a, uh, there is a, a point in time when the, the account will be locked, which is probably going to be a week or two after the roles disappear, and then 30 days after that, the data will actually disappear. But those rules and how that works is still being kind of firmed up. So just to anticipate one question, that's that. So, uh, and now, any I'll answer any questions that people might have. Yes. Can you hear? Oh, hi. Okay. So, question about delegated admin maintenance and um, what happens when one of them leaves? If there's only one delegate.
Anna, you're breaking uh, up. And they're um, the only ones who own a, a shared folder for that. And yeah, um, I mean, you this, me? you just, yeah, yeah, you're breaking up, but I, I got the gist of the question. The question is, what happens if there's only one delegated admin for a folder and the delegated admin leaves? Uh, the, then, then the unit is going to have to designate somebody else to be a delegated admin. If they don't, then they're going to have to take their data out of the shared folders in box, which I think will encourage them to name somebody else as a delegated admin. But someone has to be in charge of that folder. I guess uh, what I was really asking is, will that folder go away or will it just stay there unowned? If, let's say, the unit didn't realize that there was only one delegated admin and this person leaves and their account gets decommissioned, what happens to the shared folder? Or for the, the shared unit? folder, nothing, nothing will happen automatically. I mean, the folder, the users, uh, the, the delegated administrator's account will disappear, but the folder will still be there. So if a new delegated admin came in or was designated, um, then they could be given permission to that folder. So the data would be safe. Um, and there would have to be kind of a policy discussion with the unit to make sure that someone else was designated so that the, the help desk didn't wind up being in charge of whatever needed to be done in that, in that folder. Thank you. Other questions? Hey Tom, this is Al. Just from the um, from the chat window, it looks like yeah, I'm um, opening it up now. From Steve Camo and from Matt Kozak, they're tr trying to find the apps in the company portal, and they're not seeing them there. You may not see them right now. Some of the roles aren't set up just yet uh, in there. So Michelle, I was telling the guys here, uh, Michelle had this. Michelle Norton had this problem last night, and they had to add her to a different role. I'll talk to the to. So to this is Vlad. I can answer that question. Oh, there we go. Um, so we have only deployed those apps to the pilot group at the time when we pushed this because we didn't want to push the apps to every user before they could make accounts. That would just look weird to them. Um, and we knew who the pilot users were, but we didn't necessarily know who all the add-in users are going to be afterwards. So we can look into making sure that anybody that has an account gets added to it. But uh, if you guys feel comfortable with this, we can push the app to all the MDM users now. They just won't be able to log into it until the fourth when they can create accounts. I'm not sure which one's more confusing or less confusing. No, I think most people don't even know that that app section in the company portal exists. So I think it's fine to, to push it out now. I mean, people can frankly go to the Box website to try and log in right now too. So I, I don't think that's an issue. All right, so what I'll do, because I don't like making change, I mean, I'll, I'll talk with uh, Uriah about making that change, make it available to everybody. So, you know, prepare for some questions with people who say, I can't log in till, the, till they create their accounts, and so be it. Um, but right. we'll just push up the app to everybody, and that will make it easier for everybody from their point forward. Okay. Thanks, Vlad. From the um, chat, from Joe Pisano, he asked if students would be able to be part of the groups that we create. Yeah, you can put uh, you can put anybody in a group. If you're a delegated administrator, you can put anybody you want in there. We're also trying to establish a procedure so that student groups can get a shared folder to store data, but that's more complicated than it sounds, and we're still working out the details there. All right. Uh, and, from, go ahead. and from Tom Regan, he was wondering if we had any box workflow diagrams or documents that we could share? Uh, I have one for the creation process that I have to update, and we can put it on the Box website. I don't know what other ones uh, we would create, but if he has specific ones he wants, we can, we can make them. I can have the web guy make them. Okay, we'll follow up with Tom. everything in Rutgers, including RVHS? Yes, it goes by the uh, uh, access to the tenant. Okay. So everybody that's got a net ID and our tenant would be able to access, would, would be on the, the okay list. Good. Okay. I have a question. Sure. 
the um, departments that have GLBA data, do they require uh, to be in a PHI folder or a stricter folder? Yes. Uh, if GLBA is allowed at all, I, gotta rem I, I don't remember myself. I got to look at the, uh, let me see here. I got to look at the matrix. I thought it was on there, Tom. I just don't know what the status was. Why am I not seeing it? I'm pretty sure it's on here. Oh, yeah, the bank accounts and financial data. Right? Yeah, GLBA is financial data. So, mm -hmm. uh, no, you can store that anywhere in box. It doesn't have to be in a restricted folder. Okay, thank you. Where, where can I find the um, the PowerPoint? Uh, there. We'll put this up okay. on the box site as well. Okay, Sorry, thanks. I was going to say, like, all the material to, like, Instructions on how to manage the. Program. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I can show you the box website. Um, I mean, this is, it's box.ruckers.edu. It's not hard to remember. So, um, here's the the login sign up page. Um, there's a you know not sure what boxes for you. Learn more. There's some information there. Some key features on the bottom. And again, a box introductory video. Um, if you go into about why box, and then we have a news and updates section that we'll put new information in. Um, using Box, how to get started. So this includes information on how to create your account, what to do next, and then it takes you through. So like, what's it, what do I do next after I install the client? You go download and install the Box client on your device. So then download and install will take you, okay, I have a Windows system. So then here are the instructions on, on downloading and installing the app on the Windows system. Um, we are, uh, I think we have the updates for iOS and Android done as well. Uh, so doesn't look like he's got it posted yet. Um, so we're updating the, the the box website is still in progress. So some of the information uh, isn't done yet. Um, here is the information that the delegated administrators are going to want under information for delegated admins. So it's got the setup procedure, management uh, for box. There's all the documentation that uh, Ray and Vlad put together for how group synchronization works in, in short and in detail, managing things in box. Um, that's all in there. We have an FAQ with three different sections for general support and technical information and help. The, the work section is simply documents we're working on and haven't filed yet. So this is all additional stuff that we are still putting things in for. So this, this one will go away before launch. But you know, feel free to go through this site and, and take a look. And if you see something, like I said, it's still under construction. And if you see something that's you know, glaringly obvious, like in the document, it says, need more information here. We know about that already. But if you see something that's missing or something, you let me know. Um, it's more from the uh, chat window. From Steve yeah. Camo, does restricted collaboration to within Rutgers University include RBHS? Yeah, I answered that already. Yes. Okay. Then there was a follow up on, and this is a good one. This is the follow up on HIPAA training for, uh, for clarification on the requirement for DAs. So the work is. that we were doing with. Um, Sonia, so, uh, I'm sorry, with Miranda, so that we can get the HIPAA training yeah, in for yeah. those DAs who have PHI requirements. Yeah, I see Matt's comment on that. Um, I know there is HIPAA training at Rutgers. I've taken it, uh, so I know it exists. Um, and uh, I sent an email to Miranda about getting that information. She just hasn't gotten back to me yet, um, so we've got it. Anybody that's got the PHI flag on their account, she tells me is someone who, who was supposed to have taken HIPAA training. So that's the check we're going to use for people that have done it in the past. Um, and then we have to, uh, you know, we'll just have to have the people take it 
that need it new now. Um, but I can't give you information on it yet because Miranda hasn't gotten back to me. So um, the DAs that do not have a PHI flag on their account, but they are responsible for departments that have PHI data, will we be required to uh, take the HIP, HIPAA training? I, I don't want to make anybody um, get a PHI flag on their account that, uh, unless that's, I mean, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want one on my account um, if I didn't have to have it. Um, so the only thing that I've been told by the RPC group is that people must go through HIPAA training, not that they have to have the PHI flag turned on on their account. So um, if, you're, if you're a delegated admin and you're going to have a folder that contains PHI, then you need to go through the HIPAA training. That doesn't mean you have to have the PHI flag. That just means that you need to, you need to certify to us that you've taken that training. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? So I'll say that there is a, uh, I just received a draft message from Alan Hoffman. Um, I haven't read it yet. Uh, the, um, that of the announcement that's going to go out to the entire university about box being available. Um, I assume that's going to go out shortly before March 4th. Um, I assume that's going to come from Michelle. Um, I, if I were, if I were you, I know that I've told my staff that we need to have a communication ready to go out, uh, to our staff following hers. So I, if I were you, I would, I would suggest drafting that. So it's ready. Any other questions, anyone? Vlad, since you're online, any comments you want to add for the group? I apologize for only joining 10 minutes ago. I got caught up in a different emergency. So I don't know. I can answer what the questions are being asked, but I didn't catch the first half. <laughs> I apologize. Okay. I just thought, I mean, so everybody knows, I mean, there, there, were, two, there were two teams that worked, uh, two, two committees that worked on this. There was a governance team and a tech team. Um, and, and uh, you know, it was a lot of participation, but a lot of people to get this going. Um, but there was, there was no uh, group that was more active than Vlad and Ray in, in doing the account roll-ins and writing software for management and, uh, and you know, finding all the little uh, uh, configuration issues and, and workarounds that, that made this deployment possible. So that's why I'm, I'm asking if, if, if Vlad has, I don't know if Ray's on, uh, any, anything he wanted to add. Basically what you're all hearing is that, that, that but that Tommy is saying it's all our fault from now on. But <laughs> you know, that, you know, obviously we're going to be, you no, know, we're going to be running this service for a while. So we're going to put all the effort we can into, into making it as good as possible. So, um, you know, if you guys run into issues, I, we we want to ask your patience. And um, if we need to improve our interfaces or improve improve the processes, we're going to work on that. Um, I suspect the first couple of months are going to be, you know, there will be a lot of sprints in fixing and improving the, the various configurations we've got in place. We expect that. Um, and we'll work with you guys to get you what you need. Okay. All right. Um, I don't think we need to keep people, in, the ones that are in their offices, in their offices any later while it's snowing outside. So last call for any questions. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, you can email no. me or box support if you have a question and you're a delegate administrator. But again, don't give out that address. Thank you. Right, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom.